Coming up on episode 44 of the Up Full Life podcast. And it's just mesmerizing. It's like, uh, you know, he looks like he's possessed. So you're like, what is going on? You know, like, how how is this man feeling this music like this? No, I'm study- I remember just studying the drummer. Like, what what is the drummer doing? Like, what's he doing with his kick drum? Like, what's happening here, you know? And just, like, literally being like mouth open, jaw dropping, like what, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. I'm a bozo. Oh, yeah. yeah, I thought you had <laughs> You recognize him. I like that one. Many people like him. Yes, indeedy. Welcome to the Up Full Life Podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and this is episode number 44, coming at you live and direct from the Vibe Junkie Studios in Oakland, California. 44 at your door. We are so grateful. You are tuning in. I'm the living almanac, the teacher they call me that. Breaking them, seeing graffiti and DJ and beatboxing, fashion and language and knowledge and trading, I'm all of that. Whackers of rappers are falling flat. So I call the whale and he call me back. He asked me to come up with all the facts. So I'm going to get down with the water at. Up in the woods, puffing the good, spitting and living the way that I should. Eating the minerals, spitting the spiritual. Pick up the zeneral, all in the hood. Culture, let me indulge you, no kidding. I'm here to adult you, spitting the facts, MCing on rap. I'm bringing it back the way I'm supposed to. Trees talking, the breeze walking, MCs are often hip hop. 1520 said with the boom bap started on this block. So what's the color? What's the race? What's the other? What's the face? When it's time to spit the raw, for sure you better wrap your space. Hip hop demands no less. Wherever you are, be the best. Suburban swerving, rural urban. Grab the mic and beat your chest. No need to stress. East to west, hip hop, it turns the lights on. Yo, Jackson Whalen, turn your mic on. What's worldwide, what's good? We bumping hip hop to the city from the that's episode 42 guest Jackson Whalen with very special guest the legend KRS One from the Woods remix. From urban to rural, I battle and duel. I'm blowing a bugle because I'm not used to the way I refuse to sell out to the cuckoo the way they abuse you. This is the teacher, man. Open your pupils, steaming hot, baking your noodle. If you don't know, you can check me on Google. Your Whalen, do you? Yo, I'm from where the forest at, collabing with the god of rap, with farmers and the tourists in the farm where I'm performing at. Forget Had to give you all a taste because we talked about that on the episode a few weeks ago. Shout out my man, Jackson Whalen. Big up, large up, KRS-One. You can check out the premiere piece I put out on liveforlivemusic.com. Shout out Live For Live Music. Should have some uh, promo on the podcast coming on liveforlivemusic.com real soon. Maybe right as you're hearing this. And uh, just appreciate everybody rallying together. Support independent music and positive hip-hop. Also, I want to let folks know I dropped a feature piece on Ryan Herr and Jesse Hendrix' Cusp Remixes record with Random Rab and Moon Tricks, Scott Nice. You can find that on Live for Live Music or UpfulLife.com. So shout out Ryan Herr, Jesse Hendrix, and the Nevada City family. It's a way of life, man, this is understood But we know where it started at, yeah, what's good? We bumpin' hip-hop from the city to the woods From the street corner to your rural neighborhood It's a way of life, man, this is understood But we know where it started at Oh, 
Put some foo foo in your boo boo, baby. Yes, indeedy. Wanted to let folks know some exciting news here in the Up Full Life podcast. And for your boy, uh, you know, friend of the show, friend of the fam, Eric Krasno has the Plus One podcast. I've mentioned it a time or two, and he's obviously been a popular guest on this podcast some time ago. And he's rolling out bonus episodes called The Guest List on Osiris. So I am the co-host of at least the first two episodes. We already put out the episode one, the pilot app, which is Kraz and I just chopping it up about his pod and music journalism. And of course, we get into uh, his most popular podcast, which was the John Mayer episode. And we talk about a whole lot of stuff. I don't want to spoil it. You got to sign up through Osiris Pod. Uh, small nominal fee, I think maybe five bucks a month or something. So if you're so inclined, you want to hear me and Kraz chop it up about Mayer and eventually uh, Questlove, which we've already recorded, some some cool conversations. And then uh, we have some other stuff in the works that uh, I'm not at liberty to divulge just yet, but it's pretty big and pretty dope. So y'all will be the first to know in that regard. Also, want to remember uh, to remind y'all to please rate and review the Up Full Life podcast on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, or your pod platform of choice. It goes a long way with the algorithms channeling new listeners and attention in this direction, and we appreciate that. Thanks to everybody who has indeed left really beautiful reviews on the iTunes page. It really warms my heart. I'm super grateful. You can email me directly, b.getz at upfullife.com. I love all the feedback. Give thanks. b.getz at upfullife.com. Shoot me an email. Let me know what time it is, what you want to hear, what you love, what you don't. Speaking of what we love, you're hearing a uh, Blast Off Lettuce live from Swanee Rising last week with Krasno in the mix. He played the whole second set, day two, uh, with the boys. It was a family reunion. He also did his Kras uh, Chapter 2 project with Deitch and Nigel and Chris Laughlin. And actually, Chris Laughlin, the bassist, is playing on this Blast Off along with Kras and the Lettuce Boys. So, got a taste of that. And lastly, you know, I always got to make sure to plug the Patreon. Patreon.com backslash up full life. I'm always throwing up music, mixes, cool shit there. You get stickers. Eventually, I myself will roll out some bonus podcasts. But for now, I'm just trying to drum up some support. If you like what I do and you want to support me as a music journalist, as a podcaster, whatever it is, uh, I promise to reciprocate in many ways. Patreon.com backslash up full life. Let's hear a little bit of this blast off. Hump and Slick Rick rhyme from the nasal palate. Nas rhymes from the back of his throat. Biggie is a swinger. He swings like a horn player over jazz. B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A. No info for the 
D-E-A. He put more emphasis on the uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. He's just spelling his name. But the flow, vicious. Pac, on the other hand, I think Tupac pulled from Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. I don't know when it is that we're going to make it to the mountaintop. But one day all the children will be able to play together. All the children, all the... It's like pouring those words out because you mean it. And that's why, you know, I never had a father figure. But I was raised by the thugs and the drug dealers. That's why I love niggas. That singing that Pac was doing. In his... Shout out and hat tip to DJ Maceo of De La Soul for that undisclosed clip of Shock G of Digital Underground. Now as the record spins around, you recognize this sound, well it's the underground. You know that we're down with what you like, with what you like. And though we're usually on a serious tip, check it out. Tonight we're gonna flip and trip and let it all hang out tonight. We're gonna say what we like. Cause yo, yo, we wanna know how many people in the flow. Well, I can just let yourselves go and do what you like. What's the night, your night? Just eat food, try not to be crude. Rude, the attitude. I was gonna just get right into the interview, but uh, shortly after I recorded that last segment a couple days ago, got word of the passing of Shock G of Digital Underground. Now there's been a ton of musicians passing over the past year and a half for a variety of reasons. And most recently, uh, the world was really uh, devastated by the death of DMX. And then Black Rob shortly thereafter, a few months back, it was MF Doom. But I really wanted to take a few minutes and give Shock G his propers. Uh, Most people are well aware of Shock G and Digital Underground from the timeless party jam, The Humpty Dance, and Shock's clownish alter ego, Humpty Hump. He's also really well known for being the guy that put Tupac on back in the day as a roadie and then a dancer with Digital Underground then gave him a verse on same song from the Nothing But Trouble soundtrack before Tupac went on to probably some of the biggest stardom hip-hop music has ever seen. And Shock recognized that in a young Tupac, the Panther lineage here in the Bay Area because Digital Underground was... a Initially on some black power shit, but then Public Enemy blew up. And then uh, they were kind of some psychedelic vibes. Then De La Soul, their label mates on Tommy Boy, blew up. And this was uh, very deftly stated by Justin Sales on his article on The Ringer. But yeah, so Shock kind of just figured out a way to uh, introduce Digital Underground as all the things psychedelic funk black power and party jams and um it was digital underground that was one of the first hip-hop groups to reach me as a youngster in cherry hill new jersey watching the yo mtv rap show and seeing the do what you like video and of course humpty dance same song kiss you back so many jams And of course, Shock was a producer for many artists, not the least of which, Tupac's I Get Around, uh, which is probably the most joyful song you'd ever hear from Tupac in his short time on Earth. And Shock G's legacy stretches just beyond the Humpty Dance or Tupac I Get Around um, or the Humpty Hump Nose and Glasses. He was just a bottomless well of musicianship. He taught himself how to play the piano by sneaking into college campuses and hotels. Um, And he was an ardent uh, student of the mothership. Um, He linked up with Chopmaster J back in the day, and they basically just got busy sampling lots of P-Funk. 
eventually folding in, you know, Money B and Shmoovy Shmoove on the vocals and DJ Fuse. But Shock was always the visionary behind Digital Underground. And he liked to uh, basically say he brought the bridging the gap between Prince and hip hop. And again, uh, Justin Sales pointed out that back then, Two Live Crew was pumping out hits that, quote, turned women into two-dimensional sex objects, while Digital Underground's staunchly pro-female pleasure stance felt downright revolutionary. And what also felt revolutionary is how Digital Underground connected the psychedelic music worlds of the Bay Area. Now, it's well known that the Grateful Dead were, you know, playing fundraisers for the Black Panthers here in Oakland in the late 60s, early 70s. And there was always a connection between the cultures, if not overt, certainly covert. Um, and Shock G liked to see P-Funk as, in essence, quote, the Grateful Dead of the Black World. He said this in Check the Technique. Great book. Check it out. Quote, their concerts were more like rituals. And and then I was having this discussion with my mom, actually. She's out here visiting me and my fiance in the Bay, and we were driving to Terrapin Crossroads to see Phil Lesh with Eric Krasno. Shameless plug, check out my article on the experience on Live for Live Music. But we're driving to the show, my mom's first show in 15 months, our second show. Uh, and I'm explaining to my mom the... Uh, significance of what we're about to do and the outsized influence of the Grateful Dead in my own life. And we're listening to Alan Toussaint on the Jazz Festing in Place on WWOZ as we're driving up to the show. And at that very moment, Alan Toussaint himself shouts out Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead. Uh, and then he plays Get Out of My Life Woman, his own song that Jerry loved to play with the Garcia band. And then I was also on that same car ride pontificating to my mother about why it was such a seismic loss with Shock G, taking her back to the OMTV rap days, explaining how hip hop music was just sort of incorporated into our culture in a way that's almost inexplicable, but better than I could explain it. Jerry's own daughter, Miss Trixie Garcia, uh, she took the opportunity to post on her own socials a beautiful tribute to Shock G. Quote, Digital Underground is one of the pioneers of hip-hop music, and Shock G will become legend. Rest in peace. Thanks to them for looking out for me as a teenager. Shock G, Shmoovy Shmoov, and Tupac all knew who I was and respected the dead scene way back in 1990. Close quote. So yeah, it just was not lost on me as we traveled to see the patriarch of this whole La Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours, Mr. Phil Lesh, play the greatest American songbook to me, my mother, my fiance, here in the Bay Area, back where it all began. Another son of the P, a son of the psychedelic culture, and a pioneer of hip-hop, much like Phil Lesh is a pioneer. Shock G is also a pioneer. And uh, I had to step up and give my man his flowers because it's important that we recognize the profound legacy and contributions, not only of Shock G, but of all the progenitors and pioneers of all these art forms, music and otherwise, as they transition. Um, it's hard not to get numb to all the death and sadness, but instead of wallowing in the mire, I prefer to shine a light and celebrate and take upwards of, I don't know, eight, nine minutes and wax nostalgic and philosophic about the late, great Shock G, Digital Underground little bit of kiss you back. I don't want to get in trouble with the uh, whoever's policing these uh, podcasts. A little kiss you back. And then we'll get into episode 44. 
Long live Digital Underground. Rest in beats. Shock G. That you hear me Cause I love it when you hear me And I'm telling you sincerely That if you kiss me Girl, I'll kiss you back Cause I really, really, really like Stumbled upon this Live Acoustic piano Unplugged Duet Between the late greats Tupac Shakur And Shock G What you won't do for love For love I lay awake tonight Because I wanna be with you If you were beside me I playfully kiss you Each time I see ya The feeling gets stronger We sit a bit closer And stare a lot longer Reach for my drink And for a second we touch Want to murder our stuff Cause I want you that much The situation is a no win Cause he's my best friend But now I'm guilty I'm falling for his girlfriend It's like a trap that I'm sinking into I wake up sweaty when I'm sleeping Cause I'm thinking of you And we make eye contact And I can't hold it back Trying to shake it But the feeling comes right back Now I'm confused Cause I'm more casting but you keep calling yeah. me, saying that you come over. What do I do? You make it hard for me to choose. Tell me, you heard me. But I Go want to do for love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Yes, indeedy. Episode 44 of the Up for Life podcast is honored and privileged to welcome Chris Harford. Now, I got to say off top, I just was so fulfilled doing this. I can't really explain it. You'll understand it when you listen. It's almost 100 minutes. I was going to edit it a little bit, but I'm really not. I'm letting it ride. It is just a profound powwow. I uh, was humbled by how much of an open book Chris was, given that we'd never spoken before. I commented on a post of his once about an article I'd written about a performance he had done back in 2000, and you'll hear all about that in this conversation. It was in uh, Vermont. Uh, when I was in college up there. But Chris is a singer, songwriter, rock and roll troubadour. He started in the game back in the 80s. Um, But he is a bottomless well of music culture and color. And he has a number of projects that we discuss and endeavors, rabbit holes, etc. So the short version is I got hip to him through our dear friend, Sarah McConnell, who I've known for over 20 years and seen it shows fish to New Orleans to New York City and beyond. And she was doing some work with one of Chris's projects called Blanc du Blanc, which is a dub reggae syndicate, if you will. And they made a record called The Blanc Album, which was one of my favorites of this past year. And I did a short feature on it in my year-end project that I do annually. Uh, You can find on UpfulLife.com. And uh, that kind of connected me to Chris in the here and now. And, of course, recalled that night at Higher Ground in the Halcyon days and thought... 
wow, I should really chop it up with Chris. Um, he's probably best known uh, through Chris Harford and Band of Changes, which is sort of a revolving door concept, which has included everyone from Joe Russo and Scotty Metzger, Robbie Seahag, Dave Drywitz, Dean Ween, Kevin Salem. We talk about all those cats in depth and their musical family and the New Hope roots and the connection with Tom Marshall and Amphibian. We also talk in depth about Blanc du Blanc, the dub reggae project, a little bit about how he got his song remixed by the one and only Lee Scratch Perry, which is what you're hearing in the background. The song that they covered, Wind of Change by the Scorpions, that's like a 20 minute rabbit hole for Chris and I. He's got the record label Soul Selects. We're going to hear a little bit of Leaf of Fall, which is a song that I treasure dearly. Uh, this version features uh, Claude Coleman and Dean Ween, among others. I want to shout out my man Steve Malik, who put me onto this whole world way before I figured it out on my own. Um, thanks, SMB. Love you, brother. Here's Leaf of Fall. Hey, Chris, it's B. Getz from the Up for Life podcast. Hi, B. Getz. How are we doing today, my friend? I'm doing great, thanks. It's good to hear your voice. Likewise, likewise. And I really am grateful that you're making some time to have this conversation and been looking forward to it for a couple of weeks. So thank you again. Likewise. I wanted to ask, first off, just uh, where am I speaking to you from? I'm here in Oakland, California. I'm in a town called Hopewell, New Jersey. Right on. And, uh, I'm on a public land, 340 acres, and I'm lying on a hammock. And it's the first warm day of the season, and it feels like things are turning and changing, and it, there's birds out, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. So I'm also feeling very grateful to be here, and I'm in the ideal setting. I hope for, hopefully the wind isn't too loud or anything. You sound great, man, and it sounds idyllic. Um, I'm from New Jersey myself originally. I spent most of my childhood in Cherry Hill and Margate, and then uh, spent most of my 20s in Philadelphia. So that's still home for me, although I guess you're more on the New York side of New Jersey than the, than the Philly side or somewhere in the middle. And that's some of the stuff I want to unpack while we talk is a bit of your roots and your journey um, from from then till now. But uh, obviously our mutual friend and dear friend of mine, Sarah, uh, hooked me up with one of your latest projects, the Blanc du Blanc, uh, the Blanc album at the end of last year. And it was, as you know, one of my favorite records of the year. Uh, for whatever reason, during the pandemic, I, I sought some kind of shelter or solace or comfort in reggae music and specifically dub something about, uh, the medicinal, spiritual nature of that sound and, and those tones and whatever you want to describe it uh, just was very comforting to me during that uncertain time. So naturally, the Blanc du Blanc album uh, like just hit different and was right on time. So if you wouldn't mind, I, I, you have such a voluminous catalog, I want to touch on a lot of things, but may we start there? Excellent. Um, let's do it. <laughs> what... Uh, prompted you uh obviously whether it's you know the band of changes or any number of projects you've done what prompted you to kind of make a turn towards you know the yard and and make a dub reggae album and, and sounds like a series of records you know at this time in your life or this time in the culture what, what was behind that well i i just found what you 
said previously so beautiful and so poignant and exactly how I felt in relation to the dub music and what it brought for me over the years, the solace, the warmth, the religiosity, the spiritual nature, the depth, the uh, subconscious, the groove, the feel, everything about it was sort of the, the, over the years what I gravitated to listening to more and more and more and more. And so um, finally came to the stage where I just wanted to make, record some music for myself just to have some fun, not even really think about anything. So I just started doing that. Um, n n you know, hopefully it's not too late, never too late to try something like that. And I really enjoyed the process. And it's already been a couple of years already that I'm into it. So in terms of making it, and, um, yeah, it's just have been a really fun, explorative thing to do musically and to not focus on the word so much and just the groove and the feel is really just a, a nice, a nice change for me personally. Yeah. And, and it comes out in the art, in the document itself. I mean, you know, I did my homework on it, uh, when I was, you know, writing about my favorite records and stuff and I had, to, you know, I, I was actually really surprised to come to know that it wasn't recorded to two inch tape and was not like a traditional analog dub situation, but sonically, especially, you know, I was lucky to receive a copy on vinyl. Sonically, it, it is really warm and, and offers that sort of tomb, uh, cacophonous kind of, again, like a shelter, whatever you want to say, uh, how did you guys approach making such an authentically dub record with, you know, the 2020 tech, if you will? That's a, I'm so happy that you've noticed that. And um, that was something that was really interested me and was limited by the fact that I was working digitally and we weren't using tape. But um, at Mickey's studio in Lambertville, New Jersey, and that would be a.k.a. Dean Wing studio, and Gabe being the engineer, he has um, a beautiful Neve board. And we use tape echo machines like Echoplexes and rolling stereo chorus echoes. And so there are tape, it's tape, you hear it. It's in there and a lot of old instruments, keyboards or, you know, the old synths from the 70s and stuff. So uh, you, you get that as, as best you can with the two preamps and everything. Um, but yeah, that was something we had to go for. And then it's it's a little bit more tedious in the mixing process when you're, you can't have your, I look forward to the day where I can sort out a situation and sit at a mixing board with knobs and faders and, and have fun doing it that way. And in my mind, that's what I was doing, but it took more time than one would hope to sit there and do it through a mouse and a keyboard. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting just to mentally trying to imagine that because you know, this music is, is, is ancient, it's archaic, it's minimalist. Um, so it's almost like conceptually antithetical to make it with a keyboard and a mouse. Yet um, the results, I mean, it really, the, how the sausage is made is less important than how it tastes. And I speak from experience that it, it slid right into the rotation alongside all the classics uh, that I've been going to for decades. Oh man, that that means the world to me. I, I can I can retire right now hearing that, that you say that, and and the fact that it made one of your year end lists. Like, you know, this is what we dream about when we're making music. That someone lis out there not only listens but digs it. You know. <laughs> yeah, and, and well, yeah, you know, I'm glad that uh, it more fills your heart that way because you know, like a lot of times, especially in this era, like art, I imagine can be kind of thankless and. Maybe like you don't know how it lands short of somebody putting it in a blog or whatever. But that was a big part of why I wanted to talk to you um, was because this record was real medicine for me. And and I imagine it's the case. I gifted uh, a vinyl to a dear friend, this pot farmer dread that I've known for years and has been a major force in my life. And he's like, you know, a reggae head. And I don't think he would have found it he's not necessarily connected into what's happening now as much as the history. So he was extremely grateful for the music and it's like, wow, oh, wow, this was made this year. And I was like, yeah, he was just blown away. So 
Yeah, man. Wow. How did you put together the, the assembly of musicians? Because I, I want to touch on your sort of Kevin Bacon factor, how you've worked with so many, you know, of the household names and the sort of jam band diaspora. But with this particular project, it's like really uh, eclectic uh, grouping of musicians. So uh, take me through how you put that project together. Well, um, firstly, I wanted to mention in reference to our last point that the one of the reasons why it sounds so good too is because the vinyl runs at 45 and that's a credit to the mastering engineer scott anthony so he called it he described it as sounding like jet fuel once it gets placed onto the platter which i loved and i think that enhances the sonic quality of it too so i just wanted to make that point and a shout out to storybook sound in montclair new jersey and scott anthony the mastering engineer who i think is brilliant um at what he does so and moving on to the musicians, I have been playing in what I call the band of changes. It's gone through different names. I've, you know, I spent I spent my formative years in a, in a band with four or five people for many years in Boston and then England. And when that band broke up, I was given the opportunity to make a major label record, and I hired my high school friends and the friends I had made through that Boston band, and even people like Richard Thompson and Loudon Wainwright. And, you know, where I'm from is is a pretty potent pool of creativity between, like you said, equidistantly to Philadelphia and New York City. And when you when you said where you're from, I don't know if you remember the club Emerald City, but that Before was... Before my time, but I do know of it well. Oh, man, that place was, you know, you talk about venues and vibes and shows, like that place was incredible. But anyway, I, dive, I digress back to the musicians. So... You know, meeting the guys in Ween when they're 17, 18 years old, going to high school with Andrew Weiss and Sim Kane, um, who are the rhythm section to the Rollins band. And it's always been important to me to, like, when I make these connections and when I was liberated from being in this one band where we lived together in a house like the Monkees and practiced in the basement, you know, it was kind of like all these great people I had met through the years. And I loved making music with them. It was such an amazing conversation. And each person brought their own thing to it. Even if we're playing the same song, different people might meet for the first time on stage and bring what they bring to the song. I never told anybody, you know, you got to play it like the record or do it like this. It was sort of like, you do what you do. And and so over the years, I've been I've been doing it now for quite a long time. So starting the Blanc album, I'm playing the drums, I'm playing the bass, I'm playing the guitar and the keyboards, and I'm having fun recording with Gabe Monazzo, who's the, basically the road tech for Ween and Katy Perry. And he, he's spending the time showing me his 45 collection that he's convinced himself it has Jimi Hendrix on it in the early days, and some of which I'm quite sure he could be right, and some I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but that would that would be in between us doing takes of like just laying down things. And I knew I had to move fast because when you're given a chance to go into a nice studio like that, you got to get you do it when you can. So it just sort of evolved. And then it, it occurred to me that I wanted to get my old friend from that Boston band back in the day, Dana Colley, on saxophone because I knew intuitively that he would know what to do with it. So you know, this was kind of the first time experimenting, sending tracks to people in their home studios rather than doing it all live. And he was, of course, in the band Morphine after Three Colors. And to me, I call him now like the linchpin of our sound um, because he has such an incredibly warm tone and it's his own thing. When you hear it, you're like, oh, he is the Jimi Hendrix of saxophone. Um, so he was the first guy I thought of in addition to then, like, who else? While I was working in the studio, Mickey introduced me to Chuck Treese, and he was like, I, "You know, if you're making dub music, this is the guy you want to you want to have on it." So we had a jam session that evening, and the, the, the two or three, the three tracks that he's on, that's us meeting for the first time and jamming without really even conversing. So those are just like original pieces we came up with, and I was emailing with him earlier today about maybe doing something again. So. Um, that's one of those beautiful introductions to meeting someone who's legendary and just being like, wow, let's just make some music. And Marco Benevento was an obvious, obvious choice too, to, because of his vibe and what he hears. I knew he would get it. So it was fun visiting him in his home studio and laying down tracks. And then across town in Woodstock where he lives is Kevin Salem. And I did a track with him in honoring uh, J 
Joe Harvard, a great musician and engineer from Boston who ended up in Asbury Park, New Jersey. So it's just a long history of playing with a lot of different people. Um, and then the next couple of projects add even more people to that mix, to that pop. Word. Right on. Yeah. That was, a, that was a long answer. No, that was great. This is what my <laughs> podcast is all about, Chris, for real. The, the nerd <laughs> stuff and chasing the rabbit holes and connecting the dots. And I have so many, you know, I could... Uh, so many ideas spring to mind when you first when you talk about Dana Kali and like you know moderately familiar with morphine but definitely understand their impact and the imprint that Mark and that band left uh not just in Boston but you know in music and I and when I hear Dana I'm like you know uh, another rabbit hole that you brought up with the whole Hendrix thing is a side project I'm working on for a different pod uh which I can't say too much about but it involves uh like that era of Hendrix from like the Chitlin circuit through the Cafe Wah performance in 66 and all like chasing those 45s and those different side R and B bands that he was in, et cetera. So yes. Oh, you, you, pr you probably have to talk to Gabe then because he's, he's obsessed. It's oh, really, I would love to. It, yeah. Yeah. Put super, me in touch. It's, it's, it's super fun. Um, you know, it, it, it's just really fun to hear and like imagining the, like you said, that circuit and the journey he must've had. The, the record I made for Electra in 92, I, I entitled the band The First Rays of the New Rising Sun after the Hendrix album he was making when he passed. Um, and we got to mix at Electric Ladyland. So Hendrix has always been like the man for me. Yeah. So to, hear, to hear you're doing that sounds really cool. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check in with you on that project and put me in touch with Gabe. That would be amazing. And I just hear with Dana, it's like, you know, some of my favorite like uh, horn players or uh, in reggae, Dean Frazier, Augustus Pablo. He just like uh, doesn't ape them in any way, but just really uh, is a nice homage to that vibe. And then, and then when you bring uh, Chuck Trees up, I mean, I came up in Philly and uh, adjacent to the whole like Love Park skate scene. And Chuck is a legend. I mean, from McRad to the Bad Brains to his presence as just an iconic, you know, black skater in Philly, even before Stevie Williams, like there was Chuck Trees. So having him involved is just like a whole nother universe. And then uh, a funny sidebar with Marco is obviously I'm a huge Marco fan. Uh, yeah, I was privileged to get the tip that the duo was doing the duo thing, like the knitting factory tap bar when like, you know, there was like 12 of us in there. And, and Marco actually used to, I was in a band, but once upon a time I played music uh, and I was living in Burlington, Vermont and going to college there. And I had a band and one of my bandmates roommates was friendly with Marco from Jersey so Marco would come down and check out our band practice and uh, give up the keyboards and he'd sit down and play like our band songs. Uh, and then he would move along and go hang somewhere else. And they'd be like, can you do it like Marco? And I'd, you know, <laughs> like, uh, not exactly guys, but I uh, always had my eye on Marco. He's a great dude. I know him a little bit through the years. So I was stoked to hear. And of course he's such a sound scientist, a sound designer, uh, really ambitious, in the sort of psychedelic nature of sound besides being a virtuoso. So hearing him in the, in the, you know, modus operandi of a dub band is so cool in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. So you just nailed it on the head as to why I would have someone like him involved just because you don't even have to say anything. You just get it. And then he immediately has all these great ideas and there wasn't enough time in the day to get all the ideas down. Like you could just record with him forever. You know, there's so many toys in the studio and, he just gets the whole thing. So um, I look forward to making more music with him. And, and that being the idea too, that if we could ever find a way to present this live and Marco happens to be around and wants to sit in, like it just makes sense. It's like, Oh yeah, you would have, you would have that guy on the stage. <laughs> he, oh, doesn't yeah. know, he, he probably doesn't know that yet, but that's, <laughs> that's my, that's my plan. Well, if you build it, we will come, you know, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you referenced the fertile, soil of of where you're from and where you've made music for a long time and you know i have a moderate grasp on that being where i'm from but for the listeners who would be like what is he talking about take me back to like the halcyon days you know whether it's making those records with electra or coming you know together with the ween boys and uh, scott metzger and rana and all that stuff just i want to maybe give people a foundation for like your, your journey before say like, uh, you kind of met the Marcos and Joe Russo's of the world. Okay. Well, it starts, it starts with my high school band called random Joe and the Strillards. 
and we were a four piece and we were a really, really good band. Um, and Sean Keenan was the other partner in the songwriting. We all wrote, um, the drummer, Jason Jones and the bass player, Jeff Shango were, were, uh, a year or two younger than us. And we, we wrote original music and played some covers. We played at the YMCA and the hospital set. And we became a really like good band. And Sean had written this song called Mormon Blues, which I think is one of the greatest songs of all time. And hopefully I'll get that out. But it starts there. So we were this great band, you know, breaking up to go to college or whatever and move on. And then um, I knew I knew in that moment, like music was it. Like, this is what I want to do. Uh, and met immediately when I went to school in Connecticut, met the guys that began to span three colors where we ended up in Boston. Um, and from there, graduating at Mass Art where I met Dana Colley. And from there, we went to London. Um, and that's in the 80s. So, you know, recording at the Car Studio. And then, of course, you have, you know, Berkeley College of Music and you have 300,000 college kids there. So there are all these bands. Like the Boston scene was super fervent in that moment. Um, and what a great, like, training ground to get your wheels on. And then you're, as your band gets more and more popular, you get to take a van and drive to the South by Southwest or, or you know, go play colleges across the country. And you hear on the radio in the Deep South, like Hank Williams, and you're like, what? what? What song is that? You know, you don't even really know the history yet. And then you, as a songwriter, you're like, wait a minute, I got to go back and listen to Hank Williams and, and George Jones and then rediscover how deep Bob Dylan is. And the whole time in my childhood, is the, the, the songwriter for me would be Neil Young, you know. Um, and then I saw Bob Marley in high school, and so that was in there and opened up for the English beat. So the reggae was already in my blood, too, like, wow. And it wasn't until, like, a friend gave me a collection of his 45, like, 12 CDs of his 45 collection that it became the solace that you talked about at the top of this podcast where you just, you hear something, you're like, wait a minute, like, the driving around in my car every day, like, cleaning my house, sometimes painting to it, although mostly I like to paint in silence, but just listening and listening over and over. And then the photographer, Chalky Davies, who took the cover photograph for the specials, first album, and Elvis Costello, gave me a hard drive of more music I could listen to in a lifetime. So again, it's just this, like, you know much more about the history of it. I'm still discovering it and learning it and the, all the names and the importance of all of it. And then to think, to think that somehow, you know, I'm blessed enough to be involved in two recording projects that have least scratch Barry on them. It's kind of like, okay, I'm, I can, I can retire now and never do anything else. Right on. <laughs> Yeah. I want to backtrack for a sec because you kind of just touched on it and I read about it uh, in the Blanc du Blanc media thing. Uh, you saw Marley at the Spectrum in 79. So I saw my first Dead shows at the Spectrum. I saw my first concert, Motley Crue Warrant, at the Spectrum in 89. Uh, obviously, tons of Sixers and Flyers games in my youth. But more importantly, I can add you to the list of people I actually know in real mm -hmm. life who saw. Nesta, just I know. as little or well, as much as you want to extrapolate on that experience in your life and, you know, whatever you want to share about it, because that's monumental on a whole nother level. Yeah, I don't, I, we were bold kids, I guess, because we, we got into the back of my friend's Barracuda, maybe four of us, and went, and we were, there weren't, there weren't that many white people at the show, let alone like kids, kind of is what my recollection is. Um, but we had never experienced any bad vibes or anything. It was just like, this is the first time you realize you're, a, you know, what it looks like to be a minority in a situation or something. You're just like, wow, this is overpowering energy. And then he came on and it's just mesmerizing. It's like, uh, you know, he looks like he's possessed. So you're like, what is going on? You know, like how, how is this man feeling this music like this? No, I'm study I remember just studying the drummer, like what what is the drummer doing? Like what's he doing with his kick drum? Like what's happening here, you know? And just like literally being like mouth open, jaw dropping, like what this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Until the philosophy with old one race of theory and 
level like it brought the spirituality into something and the purpose and the meaning you know hearing him sing the song war or just like it was just the heaviest most profound thing i'd ever seen i was just like it's still to this day the best thing i've ever seen and i've seen prince who's right up there and uh you know um but that show was transcendent it was like this is incredible and 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 also the the love in the room, like we didn't get messed with. No one, everyone was cool. Like it was like this is, because going down to Philly from Jersey, you're kind of like this is scary a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> oh man, that's amazing. I appreciate you sharing that, man. Because like, you think about those transformative musical experiences, especially a person who's made his life in art, like you have. Um, I had no doubt just reading that tidbit that was something that, you know, it, the words life-changing are thrown around a little too freely, but in this case, it's the understatement. And, and I'm, you know, you can hear just all these years later when you put out a authentic dub reggae record, you know, it's like, the re- you know, how dub and reggae reverberates, you know, the upstroke, it's the echo. And like, so Blanc du Blanc is the reverberation of that night in the spectrum in 79. Yeah, and then it made sense, too, at the time in 79, like, why all the punk bands were getting into it, you know? It was like, and that's why you could relate to The Clash or The Police or something. You know, it was like, oh, of course, reggae is the coolest thing that there is, you know? Yeah, definitely. And you, and you, knew, you knew it right then. You were like, this is undeniable music. You know? And you had a brief... Dalliance, it sounds like, uh, you know, as the the singer, songwriter, rock and roll troubadour on a major label with Elektra. Um, what was that experience like then? Because obviously the music industry has changed as far as, uh, you know, how it works with labels and radio spins and sound scan and all that. But but you had uh, that experience as a professional musician. So, you know, was that a worthwhile experience? Was that a nightmare? What was the electric chapter? Uh, like? uh, no, it, it was absolutely worthwhile, despite how heartbreaking and fleeting it was. Um, and I'm sure that I joined the group of legions of musicians who were given that, that rare chance to be signed to a major label and also a label like Electra, which at the time was you know, as an artist, you're like, that's the label you want to be on. And you have the CEO of the label bringing you into his office that's decorated with artwork that you'd see in museums, you know, Picasso's and things like that. And he's got like a cane with a gold, a gold top on it or something. And he's telling you that you, <laughs> you write songs in a long tradition and you can, we're going to take your time building you up. And, you know, we have Tom Waits and Jackson Brown and the doors and, you know, you're just like, what the hell is happening? You know, and we'll let you, not only we're going to sign you and give you a bunch of money, but we'll let you produce it. So I was like, oh, okay, this is crazy. And then, you know, as soon as it all happened and we made the record, that was also at the time when the, we, I think I was among the first artists that didn't get vinyl to come out. It came out on the CD package with the long box, which I thought was really strange, and cassette. And I was so like, oh, man, this doesn't feel like a, this isn't real. <laughs> Where's the vinyl? To this day, it's, it's coming on 30-year anniversary. I want to get it out on vinyl. I'm, I'm working on that. Um, cause I think it holds up. It's, it's still as a, as a record, it's, it doesn't sound dated to me anyway. And it, it's the beginning of the picture. You, I think there's like 35 musicians on it at least. Um, there was this band urban blight that was big in the city. Their horns are on it. I wish I'd turn them up louder in the mix, but you know, it kind of gives you like a glimpse of everywhere I had been and what I, where I wanted to go kind of, um, as a as a blueprint of what was happening but it was very fast and then they gave me money and helped me make a second record which never came out and then it was over it was like everyone was fired the takeover the classic story of of you know here's your chance and you think you think something's going to happen and then it doesn't so you're like oh wow 
But you can't look at that as a negative. You were just given a bunch of money, and you got to go to Electric Ladyland, and you got to go to Bearsville, and, you know, you got to make the record of your dreams. So. And you got Richard Thompson on your album. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of that's awesome and amazing. And like you said, you're a part of a rare breed, even given that shot. And also, I'm sure it informed your, your not just your art, but just how you carried it in general moving forward, having had that experience. I checked out a little bit of that first raise of the New Rising Sun stuff and uh, found uh, some kind of press release or review that called it, uh, quote, handsome quilt of gentle country rock, simple acoustic soliloquies and raging noise rock storms, which is like something I felt like I could have written. It was so on, on the money, you know, and I say that humbly. I'm just saying, like, if I was asked to describe what I've come to know just about you as an artist, that I would have said a lot of those things. And, I, you know, I think listeners that are hearing this conversation do well to check out uh, Chris Harford and the first rays of the new rising sun. Um, but my my experience with you, like my introduction to you was a seismic night in my life. I don't know. I think I commented on some social media posts a couple of years ago about this, but it was uh, November 18th, 2000 at the higher ground in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, it was a tow bill, Chris Harford band of changes and amphibian, which, you know, I was, a, I am still a big fish fan, but at the time I was like a fish kid going on tour, patchwork pants, the whole nine. And so the connection to fish with Tom is what drew me to higher ground. What made the night interesting outside of the music was that I was, it was the, uh, very embryonic stages of me writing stuff about music on the internet, which, you know, took many, many years, but eventually became my life's work, passion, vocation, whatever you want to call it. And this night was really crucial for that because jambase.com had just started uh, publishing some of my uh, reflections or reviews, if you will. And I happened to be there that night when uh, Trey obviously came out and played music with you guys. Um, so that, that was like a jackpot. I got to write that story. I was like man on the scene. It was a big blueprint for me personally, but musically it introduced me to you. It introduced me to Metzger. Um, and I, just the collaborative nature, like I, it took me years to understand how profound these relationships were of who was on that stage that night. Um, and, and the, the song that I took home with me and that I still love was Leap of Fall, which you know, I then found it as like this nine minute epic at the end of one of your records. Um, so I want to talk about all that. I want to talk about that night, those guys, Princeton, New Hope, um, anything you want to reflect on, uh, it, specifically that performance, but also just those guys, those relationships, that music, and, and really that song, Leaf of Fall. Wow, that's, that's wild. That's wild that you were there. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to remember that period of my life, like what what phase we're in. Um, but I had a little red schoolhouse outside of Lambertville, New Jersey, in between Lambertville and Hopewell. And Claude Coleman lived up the road in a on a hundred acre tree farm in Hopewell, New Jersey, which I eventually moved in that house as well. Um, so there was a lot of music being made. And um, I had remembered Tom from seeing him around town growing up as a kid and knew some of the people that he knew. My brother had gone to the same school that they went to. I went to the public school. They went to the, the day school. Um, and I'd been hearing about this band Fish, I think through first through this guy Brad Morrison, who, who actually released their first EP, maybe. Does that name ring a bell to you? He had a little label. And he they he put out Miracle Legion records, which were big. I was a big fan of, and we all became friends. He might have managed them or something. And he told me about this band Fish. Um, it took me a while to realize that Trey had gone to school in Princeton. Um, oh, and then I, that reminds me, I I was asked to jam with Matt Kohut and Peter Catoni. Um, and I guess I knew them from the town, but those guys had gone to school with Trey and Tom. And in fact, Peter Catoni is in a very early version of jamming or dead, maybe like traveled with Trey. It gets, goes pretty deep. And those in the fish scene would know better. And he, he was one of the two drummers in Amphibian. So um, it kind of started with that, with Matt Coat 
and and Peter Catoni and my friend John March, who was who's become my partner in the record label, the revising of of the Soul Selects record label is now releasing the dub stuff. He was getting married, and he, I think he asked me for a good wedding band, and I suggested F Hole, which was this instrumental trio with Matt Collette and Scott Metzger, a 17-year-old Scott Metzger on guitar, and J.P. Wasiko on drums. Um, and they are the rhythm section on the album Wake, which features that song, Leaf of Fall. There might be a couple of versions out now, but that's the first version that came out. And I wrote that song, Leaf of Fall, in the schoolhouse outside of Lambertville, um, the schoolhouse was from the late 1700s, a tiny little thing, and it, it and this majestic tree out in the backyard, and it had an old piano in the house. And I think Dave Drywitz, the bass player, came by, and I recorded the demo on a four-track, and Mickey came over and played like lead on it. I have a four-track demo of it. I should send it to you since you like the song so much. Just plastic battleship pipe bombs for the human race. In my mind, I was writing, it's kind of funny, I was in my mind writing a song, I, I was trying to think like Oasis and Wonderwall, I think, if I remember correctly, if it was around that same time. So that's just ridiculous to me when I look back on it, but somehow... Inspiration comes from funny places. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's actually accurate or my memory is just messing with me, but somehow that just thought just came to me when I was writing the song. Um so I go to John March's wedding and there's, I meet Scott Metzger for the first time on the stage. And, you know, fast forward to years later, you talk about going to the knitting factory and seeing the duo. Scott was like, Oh, you got to meet these musicians I'm jamming with at the knitting factory. You got to sit in one night. So I came and with my guitar and played with Joe and it was like, Holy shit. Like Joe Russo, like this is incredible. You know? So then that's, I started playing with them and then met with Tom Marshall, who I guess was, had already had Amphibian going. Maybe, I think he called, at the time we were referring to it like Amphibian 1.0 or 2.0, and I think there's now 4.0 maybe. But we were maybe Amphibian 2.0. And we came in as like a group of musicians with this idea to to write, to make music with Tom. And then I was, and Tom brought me to my first fish shows, Madison Square Garden, I think it was. And funny Sarah McConnell, you know, she's like, you know, did you see fish? And once I mentioned that, she immediately realized that I think it was maybe their first time playing there or something. Um, and she, she asked me how many times I'd seen them. I was blown away by how many times she's seen them, let alone just at Madison Square Garden. But oh yeah, uh, yeah, it was like a glimpse into this world. It was like, oh my God, these are guys that I've kind of grew up with through association. And look at them. They're like selling out Madison Square Garden. This is mind blowing. Um, and, and Tom had, you know, big ambitions. Tom was like, we're going to open up for, you know, fish at Madison Square Garden or something on New Year's and we'll play all these shows and we'll play like the state theater in Virginia and Burlington. We were like, sure, let's give it a try. Let's, why not? Like, great. <laughs> How fun. We're trying a band with two drummers. Uh, did we have three or four guitar players? I think, um, and Tom was playing some keyboards and, uh, there's a version of the wedge that we recorded, I guess. And yeah. You played it that night. Yeah. So we have that. That's on the interweb somewhere, I think. Um, and we, we did some recording with that and experimenting mixing. And we would, took it to my friend, Adam Lass's studio, a fireproof in Brooklyn and Red Hook and worked on it there, I think. Um, and then, yeah, I got to have a little run of a bunch of shows. 
which was introducing me to like what the jam scene was like. Like, wow, this is, this is wild. I don't know. Like looking out at all the kids like yourself and the audience, I think a lot of them were just like, what is this? Like, this isn't necessarily fish or we didn't, we didn't have that magic that we could happen to transform a crowd. Like, maybe like Jerusa's almost dead does or whatever the bands that have that magic have. Like, I think we were just trying to figure it out. Like, Oh, how does this go? What? It, let's experiment. Really? We were experimenting and, and probably learning too, learning on the spot. But that night when Tra- Trey got up, he took my strat and, and played with Scott. I wrote about that specifically. Yeah, I, th- I think I remember reading your piece and I got, someone sent me a photograph of that moment where, I think Scott's playing the guitar behind his head or something. I don't know. And Trey's playing my my Strat, which I don't think he's ever really played. No, he doesn't. That's why I put it in the story. That's right. And my strap is really long for him. It's just funny looking. So, um, yeah. And Trey was, uh, and I've met him a few times. He's always very, very kind and just a nice guy. You know. Um, I wish we could jam together more. I know Dana's gotten to play with him up, gone, gone up. In fact, I ran into Trey. He was mixing one of his solo records at Electric Lady, and I ran into him on the street. And he brought me down to hear some of the mixes, and Dana was on that. He had gone to Vermont to record at the studio. Um, so, yeah, again, like little tie and all these musicians who happen to be from the same area, drinking from the same well or something, you know? Yeah, it's, it's funny because, you know, uh, and thank you, man. That was a deep response to the to the question. I know it's like a wine raging question, and you you checked off a whole lot of it. So yeah, man, it's a deep pull those times and that night. I you know I didn't understand any of it other, as far as the history and the relationships, but I sensed just knowing Tom and Trey's relationship and uh, that it was going to be something not to miss. Um, but what I didn't realize was like I said, just the introduction to all these other musicians. Uh, in addition to Leaf of Fall, as I reviewed the story I wrote, uh, talked about the guitar stuff. And yeah, there were three guitarists, then Trey, so at some point, four guitars. What was really remarkable about that night, especially the fact that I got to write about it and it kind of put me on the map in some ways for like, oh, you know, man on the scene for this music is just that... I had a lot of blinders on at the time because I was, you know, really into the fish. Um, I still love, like I had just seen D'Angelo on the voodoo tour. When you talk about electric lady, Um, like it wasn't like I was totally naive to other stuff, but shortly after this concert, or actually just before this concert, uh, fish had gone on a hiatus that would last about two years and just finding out about Metzger and, and you and, and that whole world that turned into Rana and by extension, the duo and band of changes was kind of like fluid the whole time you had different members and stuff. It just gave us some other stuff to get into, um, which, you know, was important to growth as a music fan and certainly as a music journalist. And, and even though like it was Trey that maybe brought you into my own radar, I think for the, the big picture for the younger fans, who, you know, aren't old enough to remember the Electra days or, or that time in your career. I think Joe Russo really uh, is responsible for, uh, you know, just so many people finding out about your music, your songs. And he's, you know, you, there's collaborations between you two run the gamut from your projects to his projects. You've even joined Dead and Company. I think the same night as Jimmy Fallon, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, Joe, it's funny because... I was in college in Vermont and my buddy who was a year older than me was going to school at university of Colorado in Boulder. And he, we were back on like Thanksgiving break. I want to say 97. He gave me the fat mama Mamata CD. Uh, His name is Ross Kaufman. If he happens to be listening, thanks Ross. Um, And, and that put Joe on my radar uh, in the fat mama era. And he's a huge fan of those guys into their wetlands era. And then, from that, the duo, and I already knew Marco when he used to like come to our band practices and and crush it in the Jazz Farmers days. So it just felt really organic. So then when Joe started to sing your praises about how epic of a songwriter you are, and just like as a rock and roll troubadour, um, you know his integrity, his history, his his like cachet 
you know, is like, uh, it carries a big stick. Um, so I was just curious, you know, you already established how you kind of like found out about him or whatever, but what is your musical relationship with Joe like uh, in terms of the creative process, making records, performing, or just, you know, Sergio Russo, the dude? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, so last night I was around a fire pit in the next town over Rocky Hill, New Jersey, with two of the original members of Rana and Joe Russo. And it, 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 there's a, it happened organically, but a scene around this area now with world-class musicians, including Joe and those guys and um, John Shaw, Stephanie Sanders, um, this group of people we're all living nearby and um, Joe and I are going into uh, a relationship where we're, we're going to have a studio. We're going to share a building where he'll have a studio and I'll have a studio. So that gives you an idea of what our relationship is like. And I've convinced him to play some drums on the next Blanc du Blanc album, Regatta du Blanc. Um, and actually Joe is instrumental in naming the band Blanc du Blanc. I had the name, I, I had created this character that basically was a rapper in my mind named Blanc Du Blanc. And when I, when I was doing the dub music and I wanted to put it out, he, I, I was fooling around with names like Dubatronic Chronic or I didn't know what I was going to call it. And he's like, you already have the name. You got to call it Blanc Du Blanc. And this was right before we were about to go on stage as Band of Changes at the Hopewell Theater. I was like, what, really? And I, like it, it stayed in my mind. I was like, Blanc Du Blanc, calling it... It didn't even occur to me that Dub was in the name already. That was my friend Ian Everett who ended up doing the the, the, the font for the logo and did the album artwork. You know, he he highlighted that. I was like, wow, I didn't even know that. So then, and then you know, and it, Joe Russo immediately after he says that, he says, "You can call your first album the Blanc album." And then and then and then Dave Drywitz chimes in immediately after that. He's like, "And you can call your second album Regatta Du Blanc Du Blanc." And I was like, "Okay, that's it right there." That that's the concept. That's the name. There it is. <laughs> so, uh, I'm working on a, a way to try to present this live and my vision, you know, is pretty grandiose. And it, I, I, I envision Blanc du Blanc live, you know, it's this carnival costumes. Is it P-Funk in the seventies or is it Mardi Gras or what's happening? You can't really see you can't see who it is. You're probably music fans will know that that's Joe Russo on the drums, just by the way he plays. But um, it, you know, we're, we're figuring out a way to do that live. And I, I'm, I've got, I've got a bunch of musicians, very talented musicians, getting together in the ensuing months to try to figure out, hey, could we present this live? And in my dream mind, I'm at some kind of festival somewhere or at some CBD convention. And they're, we're playing, you know, the late night cherry tent or whatever. And <laughs> everyone's had their full day and then they can relax or unwind to this late night, like jam of some dub music and see all, you know, like this most amazing fish style light show, like fish has the best light shows, obviously, right? Lasers and light shows and, and the right. characters on stage. And hopefully Marco and Joe would want to sit in and Scott Metzger because they played that day and, get Dave up on the trumpet or whatever, just a bunch of people. We have this core band and it's people, you know, we're, we're, we're laying it down live and then live, there's no end to the possibilities of what could happen. You know, Robbie Seahag Mangano on guitar and Dana Colley and maybe Stuart Bogey on horns and, you know, Chuck Trees, <laughs> Chuck Trees is there too. Like my, my, my brain is on fire about how to, the potential that could take place live in that jam setting where you're kind of free to improvise, but uh, you also you have the foundation of all this music we've already created. And Joe, you, like I think I mentioned Joe will be on that, the Regatta Du Blanc album that comes out in July. And we'll continue to do this as a, as something to do for fun, really. He kind of makes, he's one of the, I don't know if he's make, he's pulling my leg and making fun of me. My, my, my reggae obsession, he's already kind of like, really still, still obsessed with reggae. And I, I don't know if he understands that it's not really going to go away for me. It's like something that's, that's really quite deep. And I, I continue. I, I look forward to getting back into Band of Changes and singer songwriter stuff. And I love, I love sitting in with J-Rad. I think you referred to them as Dead and Company, but 
with the Jimmy Fallon thing, it was J Rad, and and I, I'm I'm beginning a That's reputation. What I meant, if I said, yeah, 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 um, I, we're beginning a reputation as like fitting in on their encores, doing Neil Young's covers. So I hope to continue that tradition where I get to, I get to live my Neil Young fantasy, Chris Harford and Almost Crazy Horse. I, I <laughs> That's like, incredible. I would, I would love to do a whole tour of that. Yeah, getting back into like Chris Harford singer songwriter stuff, but in the meantime, I'm having a blast with this alter ego and this character, which I think resonates with like small children. I'm noticing like seven year olds, five year olds, really seem to grasp Blanc du Blanc and what it is, and they like it. Oh, that's amazing! I love that it's connecting with kids. There's so yeah, many, so many, uh, you know, things that you just dropped that I would love to rabbit holes. I'd love to chase, but one of them, I, I got to do it. Um, Mike Dillon was on the show a few months ago and he went on about Robbie Seahag for a minute. Uh, oh yeah. I was in so great. Yeah, dude, it was, it was cool because r- shortly after that amphibian show during like the quote hiatus of fish, when we were chasing a bunch of rabbit holes, somebody put me on to uh, my buddy, Steve Malik, who I played in my high school band with. Uh, he put me on to sound of urchin. And then somehow through that, I found Robbie Seahag and I saw him perform once and he was insane insane wizardry on the guitar uh unlike anything i'd really heard in a minute or seen performed five feet in front of me um but i haven't really you know explored a whole lot of of his stuff outside of that other than some tangential connections but what is your relationship like musically or otherwise with robbie well so one of my missions with this project is that robbie become the superstar and the world knows it that he is because that, like you just said, he is a guitar phenomen- phenomenon, and the people need to know. So I want him featured front and center. Um, he's on the Wind of Change EP, for instance, and, and is vitally involved in all of the creation of that. Um, but I first met Robbie at, at some sort of Ween fan function in someone's party in their yard, somewhere in Pennsylvania, not far from New Hope. And he was probably 17 or 18 years old and sitting in the yard with a guitar. And it was obvious right then. I was like, what is happening with this young kid? Um, And we stayed friends from that moment. And he eventually started playing gigs with me. Um, And I always knew that he was just the craziest guitar genius. But I happened to be living in Zurich, Switzerland, after I had done a tour in Europe with Joe Russo and Matt Coat and Scott Metzger with a band of changes through a short tour of Europe in, I think, 2006, maybe. And I ended up living in Zurich, Switzerland, for a period of like eight or ten months. My daughter Amanda was going to school on the other side of the country, on the French-speaking side. And uh, I was in the Swiss-German center of Zurich and went to see this Zappa band with the four original grandmothers of invention in the band, Don Preston, um, and Eric Estrada on bass and Napoleon. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess maybe three and the, the drummer was somehow connected, but there was Robbie playing the guitar in the band, the Zappa parts. And the show was like three and a half hours long. And I, I stood right in front of him at this venue, you know, and I'd known Robbie for years already. And although I'd seen Zappa at Princeton Dillon Gym in 1972 as like a 10 year old kid, it never, it, it didn't resonate with me like it does with Zappa Head. Um, I appreciated it. But to see Robbie do that live for three and a half hours, I, my mind was, again, just shattered to the bone. I was like, what is happening? So the fact that he was capable of doing that, let alone, like, all the other stuff he can do, you know, that shows you where his brain is. 
And then, of course, you know, he plays in the, the Goats of the Sabretooth Tiger with with Sean Lennon and Mike Dillon. And um, I think Mike got him the gig with, uh, what's her name, singer-songwriter that I'm spacing on now. Who says, Ricky uh, Lee Jones. R- Ricky Lee Jones, yeah. Like, he just did a tour with her. Like So he's recognized as this, and he plays many different instruments, too, with her. Um, so... Yeah, that's Robbie. So there's a perfect example of a kid that I've known for a long time and watched watched his trajectory and think to myself, like, how is this guy not like a superstar, like Steve Vai level superstar? It's beyond me. So what can what can we do? Let's get let's make this happen. So despite the fact that he might be behind a mask, you will know when you see him, you'll be like, That is Robbie C. Hack Marcano. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. From your lips to jaw ears, man. The world should know. You sound like my buddy who was trying to convince me to go see him uh, way back when. Just had the same sort of reaction, like, "How is this guy not a guitar god?" So, yeah, man. And 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 you've been next to a Metzger for a long time too. And I think, I mean, Metzger does such an amazing job with J Rad. And of course, I remember him uh, in Rana who were like a phenomenon in their own right, if a regional one. Um, but he's such a gifted musician on so many levels, jazz, singer, songwriter, folk stuff. Um, and he speaks about you. And I don't want to make you blush, but uh, I was reading some quotes where it just talks about the profound effect. You're, you're <clears throat> like you as a musician and you as a songwriter have had on him. What is a, uh, Anything you want to share about your relationship with Scott? Because he's another one. Well, people do know. I think a, a good portion of it is in, within the framework of the J-Rad thing, which is also obviously a phenomenon and an unstoppable force and a thrill. But it's it's merely like 10, 10% of Scott's wheelhouse. Right, right. Yeah, so Scott is it represents someone to me who's like um, – he takes it to the level of family. Like that's what this is. When, when you're playing with him or you're conversing with him to watch his trajectory and his growth as a human being, not only as a player, because he's constantly reinventing himself and challenging himself and learning more. And just his breadth of knowledge now is so expansive. And I've watched that happen from that 17 year old kid at the wedding to where he is now. In the same way that Mickey Melchiondo, I watched him from a 17-year-old like become one of Rolling Stone's greatest 100 guitarists, and Robbie C. Hag Mangano from 17 to now. It's just like these people are my fam. These are my brothers, my family, um, and it it takes on a spiritual level because of that. Because it becomes more than the music. It sometimes it becomes life-sustaining and vital, and we can we can lean on each other with really deep, deep human personal stuff. And that's the relationship I have with Scott. Right on. It goes goes very deep. Yeah. I feel it. I feel it, man. Um, Yeah. And I appreciate that. You know, that's part of what makes your career so remarkable is uh, these profound, intimate relationships that you share with uh, just a myriad of, you know, impactful artists and they all say, you know, uh, glowing and admiration for you. Uh, like, you know, you don't really hear all the time people profess upon their peers or their friends or their collaborators. So it's clearly reciprocal. And I think that that's, you know, was a big motivating force for why I wanted to chat with you outside of, you know, my appreciation for Blanc to Blanc or Leaf of Fall, just the the depth of the musical and, and familial and spiritual relationships that you share with so many folks. But now I'm going to take a hard left because I think it's going to connect a lot of the dots. I follow the Wind of change, right? So before I loved the dead or fish or 
any of the stuff that I'm into. I was I was like a mullet wearing back patch on the denim jacket having Hesher. And so Wind of Change uh is you know, like an anthem from those days and uh I wanted to start with the fact that or ask, are you aware did you listen to the podcast about the song? Uh it's funny you say that. I uh Bobby Bobby Hate, the tour manager from Humphreys McGee told me about the podcast maybe like the day after I had the idea of doing the song and then that sealed the deal. I was like, well, then I have to do it. And I hadn't listened to the podcast yet. And my girlfriend, Marissa, listened to it. Um, so I started listening to it and she says it gets really good around episode four and five where it gets deep into like the managers and stuff. But to be to be honest, I had didn't finish it because I felt like the, the, the journalist was sort of stringing me along and I already sensed that I had a feeling or maybe I just didn't want to acknowledge that that even could be true. And I believed ultimately what I've, I don't want to ruin it for people, but in my sense, I'm thinking Klaus, the guy who wrote the song, will say no, that the CIA did not write the song, that I wrote it. But I well, of it. course. I mean, <laughs> uh, and I, don't, I, I don't know. Maybe that's why I didn't, I couldn't finish it because I didn't even want to, I didn't want to hear about any other possibility that this guy wrote it with his bandmates. <laughs> I see. Well, I'm not saying I believe it or don't believe it. Uh, as a podcaster, I found it entertaining. And yeah, it definitely kind of gets thrown together at the end. And, and your prediction is uh, on, the, on the money. Uh, but, but more just the... Uh, it was so strange because, you know, you li- I was listening to Joe Russo on a podcast with Eric Krasno talking about what he termed butt rock. But really that, that sort of 80s, like hair band, hard rock thing. Um, and that's actually some of the few conversations I've actually had with Joe over the years have been about like Iron Maiden. So it's, it's funny uh, that, you know, the connection with all these people you're talking about and then a song like wind of change, which is couldn't be further uh, like, you know, culturally from reggae, uh, which is what makes it such a, I, I wasn't sure if it was an ironic take or like sheer admiration. Um, and then that's why I asked about the podcast because that if if you consider the Cold War ramifications or context, I should say, of the song, especially now, like where we're living in this like whatever political uh, cultural climate with the whole, you know, I don't want to get political, but you know, Russia and you know socialism and all these things that are in the zeitgeist uh, in this sort of pandemic time. Uh, and then framing wind of change uh, as this sort of uh, socio-political anthem, it's so deep all of a sudden. Forget like the, is it a CIA psyop or not? Just the sheer power and and sort of history and education woven into what was in essence like a hairband power ballad from the Headbangers Ball era. It's such a mindfuck. And then you go and do an EP with Lee Perry (laughs) interpretations of this song. So I want to finish here. I actually want to touch on your visual art, too. But but let's get into (laughs) Window Change. Why? How? uh, What are you saying, uh, if anything, by uh, giving this song this energy? Well, I guess it, 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 it starts with the pandemic happening. And life's getting very strange. And um, I get a message via Facebook that there's um, someone who's aware of my music, probably through the scene of Ween, and knows that I'm a painter and wondered if I had a painting for sale. He happened to be in the area near my hometown. He was passing through. And did I have any paintings for sale? And I did. And I showed him some pictures. And he, we agreed to meet in the, in the ShopRite parking lot couple miles from my home and you know we pulled up awkwardly this is pretty early on in the pandemic so we pulled up awkwardly like a couple of parking spots away from each other and he was with his friend um and he introduced me to her and he opens up the back trunk of his car and he's got this he he, he, he buys the painting and he hands me some cash and it's slightly awkward. He's like, Hey, would you like a painting of mine? And I kind of peeked in and I was like, Oh man, really? That's kind of really awkward. Um, and he said, 
I want you to have one of these paintings. And I, I, so I accepted, graciously accepted one of his paintings. And he's like, also take this. And it was a DVD of a documentary of the band Anvil. He's like, do you know the band Anvil? I'm like, no, I don't know it. Um, and that is actually a great doc for the record. (laughs) Yeah, it turns out it was because I, it took me several weeks to watch it, but one really late night with my girlfriend, Marissa, we started watching it. She, she wanted to avoid it because I don't know, for whatever reason, it was like, I don't, I don't really want to watch that. So I just put it on one night really late. We just started, we were, we just, we couldn't stop watching it. And at the, some point in the movie, the band is playing in Russia, I think with Scorpions on the bill. And she asks me, you know, I'm like, I don't know anything about this band. I don't know anything about any of this music, really. And she was like, what? What are you talking about? Like, you don't know the Scorpions? I'm like, no. And maybe she's, I think maybe they were playing Rock Me Like a Hurricane. I was like, okay, I remember that song on the radio. Um, and then she's like, well, what about Wind of Change? I'm like, no, I don't know that song. So I think she paused the movie and had me watch the video on YouTube of Wind of Change. And I immediately, I immediately heard it as a reggae song because of the groove of it in my mind. And that's just something my mind does. I'm like, oh, you wouldn't even have to slow that down or speed it up. You just turn the beat around and make it a reggae song. And then I immediately also recognized what a great anthem it was. I was like, wow, that's a pretty deep song. And then it occurred to me, you know, how deep it was just politically, like all those reasons you were saying. And I thought, okay, I'd love to do a cover of that song. And then it wasn't until the next night when we had dinner with Bobby and he's like, have you heard the podcast? I was like, okay, I'm definitely going to do a cover of that song. And that was the, the fastest turnaround from conception of the idea to doing something to having it done and then out on vinyl. It took about five months, which to me is crazy because the Blanc album was several years in the making as all the other projects are generally. They just take forever for whatever reason to get them printed and the whole thing. So the idea that this could come out that quickly, and of course it, it needed, We want, our goal was to get it out by the time the election happened, and we got it out maybe a week after the inauguration. So we were pretty close, but it feels timely. And it, um, and then, you know, the beautiful, the, just being open to something like this, like meeting this kid because he wanted a painting and him handing me the thing, everything was happening sort of very organically and learning about the song, um, and I knew Joe, I wanted Joe on it cause I knew Joe would understand the scorpions. And of course he did. And he was like, you know, I, I was really fixated on doing it note for note, even, even though I was making it a reggae groove, I wanted it to be note for note. Unlike anything I've ever done. I never wanted to, I don't really care that much, but for some reason, even Robbie was asking me like, why does this have to be note for note? No one really seemed to understand. Joe didn't really understand. He was like, just make it a reggae. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, no, no, no. It's got to got to have the drum fill. It's uh, like, I was very particular. Um, so he was like, well, if you're being particular, like that's, that's not really the harmony on the, the chorus. You need to get the harmony note right. And I tried to get him to sing it. I tried to get him to play drums too, but he was moving his family from New York out here to Jersey and it was too much going on. I got Dave Butler to play the drums, um, who plays with Marco and who I was recording with earlier today, by the way, but amazing um, player also. He, yeah. Uh, yeah. Another, another, and another guy that's in this local community of our wrecking crew, muscle shoals thing that's happening here in Hopewell, New Jersey. But, um, I digress again. So then, so then Joe's like, look, I can't, I can't quite hit that note, but the guy you need to get is, is uh, this kid. I, I was in a high school band with Constantine who was the finalist in the first American Idol. They're like, what What are you talking about, you know? So that, that, that was like another thing that could be ironic, you know, getting him to sing background vocals. And then late night, 2 a.m., seeing Lee Perry. I'd already, I'd been brought to tears because I produced a record called Solid Bronze at Mickey's studio. And, and they, that label, that album came out on a little label called Schnitzel in the U.K., which I had put a record out on too, and how I got to tour with Joe and Scott over there in Europe. But they had a connection to get Lee Perry to do a remix of one of their songs. So I'd already, that had already brought me to tears that that had taken place. So I knew it was a possibility that Lee Perry might work on something, but it wasn't until like two or three in the morning, Lee Perry posts on Facebook, like, Hey, if anyone wants my vocalization or, or any mixing done, you know, send me some tracks. And I'm like, Oh my God. So I sent him wind of change. And, you know, you, 
I can't, you can't make that up. Like, I can't believe it to this day. I pinch myself. I can't believe that that's happened. You know, that's just crazy. That's crazy to me. It's incredible and beautiful and hilarious and serendipitous. All the things, man, that is, that is, that is really, I, you know, I couldn't figure out where you would be coming from possibly with the wind of change thing, which is why I started with the podcast. Um, but the fact, I mean, there's so many layers to that, like the Anvil doc, the Ween fan, you know, I, the sidebar to that is how beautiful, how like beautiful and human and organic is the passion that, you know, fans have for bands, you know, few fans, you know, rabid nature rivals that of like a Ween fan. And to seek you, this Ween adjacent, you know, cult singer, songwriter, of lore out, not for music, but for visual art. And then, uh, for this, you know, next layer of wind of change to be born out of that, you know, strange, beautiful interaction. Um, and then it not even be like he handed you the scorpions vinyl, but it was, there was going to be another layer and another layer, you know, and, it's it's just incredible, man. I love it. Uh, it just makes it. And then the Lee Perry is just like gravy. It's like how, you know, out of bounds is the whole project to begin with the song in that format, how it happened. And then for, you know, a Mount Rushmore reggae producer, <laughs> the, the <laughs> dub icon, you know, like you, to be like, yeah, I'll can't. touch that one. It's like, what? <laughs> you can't even you can't say it any better. I'm so happy that you appreciate this and you get it and like that's exactly that's exactly it. The whole you know to, the the more the longer I do this you just open yourself up to these things. And you talk about the human connection like here was this kid who yeah bought he bought his car from Dean Ween several years earlier and he gave me the painting that had like his cat a, a dead his cat that had recently passed away and had a cat hair like in the frame somewhere and I, I later saw the word God like in the painting that I didn't see when he first gave it to me um, and it's just at so many levels of so many depths of humanity and like I just love it too I love I love how it just happened o organically everything just took place Robbie Seahag immediately got the concept and assembled the tracks and note for note could play the guitar solo um, and then, you know, got Scott Besker on it and John Shaw and other people too. They're just, it happened so beautifully and in such a collaborative effort that I, it thrills my heart to no end that it took place. I think that it's imperative that you make the time to listen to the pod Be only because of, you have such a profound organic serendipitous connection to the song. Um, the band Scorpions, you know, for for better or for worse, they were like uh, two by four, kind of like whack you over the head with horrible sexual innuendos, like hard rock from like maybe like the, the pre Sunset Strip days, right? And then like you know, I got all wrapped up in like that was my first love. Like I mean, I got Master Puppets on cassette for Hanukkah. I think I was ten or eleven, but I, whatever. I gravitated towards Motley Crue and. And Cinderella, I even like met Tom Kiefer from Cinderella in the supermarket because they're a Philly band and he was living in Cherry Hill. So like I was really connected to that world. And I stayed up every Saturday night, watched all three hours of Headbangers Ball, recorded it on VHS, rewatched it for the whole week. You know, like it was my whole identity, like my passion for music, which is why I'm even talking to you, is born out of that scene when I was like coming of age. So amazing. I think and Joe Russo's similar in that way. Yep, like, that's so. why we talk about it. My best friend, yeah. Jason Abrams, who I grew up with and went to a lot of these hair band concerts with, he, anytime Joe's project comes to Philly or did for years in the pre-J-Rat era, Jason would show up at the show with like 10, 20 DVDs of like 80s and 90s hard rock and heavy metal for Joe. You know, yeah. it was like it was just, yeah. he didn't ask for him. He just showed him, you know, to appreciate him, you know, kind of thing. So it's just like where we're from and kind of where I had to like fight... Basically, it was like my half-sister took me to see The Grateful Dead in 92. That changed everything. 
<laughs> but I don't want to digress there. I want to just finish up with the wind to change thing to say, if you knew the scorpions as you do, and then you understand like the whole, you know, meaning for the Moscow Music Peace Festival and us sort of like shipping all the hair bands and the hard rockers of the day over to parade this, you know, debauched, just kind of really strange branch of the rock and roll tree to Russia. And then yeah. from that to come this like, uh, you know, global anthem for, for the yeah. changing of the guard. It's really hard to, to make that leap. And that's why this, this podcast, while I'm not saying it's true or not true, like it's worth listening to because it, it really gives you an understanding of either it's, it's, not Klaus's hand, and that is propaganda of CIA or not, or it's an incredible human transformation. Right, and it brings up a lot of interesting questions, and I know that in the podcast it talks about other artists that were used in that way too, Nina Simone or Louis Armstrong. Correct. Um, so I found all that fascinating, and I do, you know, time and life is moving by so swiftly, I would like to actually finish it, because it did bring up all those interesting things, and um you know, Joe's love for a band like Kiss or something, it all ties into this thing. I didn't realize how how big that song was in the rest of the world, you know, until I saw the video. And then I started asking people, and they're like, yeah, that song is massive, you know, especially in the rest of the world, let alone America, because America, I just missed it. So, um, yeah, it is it is deep. and then And then the idea that it's like a... I don't know if it's because he's German and he's writing in English, but you know the words are a little a little odd. The, the translation are just you know the the phrasing of them are strange. It's poetic because of that. It's like oh, this is strange, strange use of the language. That could but, be the disconnect between the language, or it could be a non-songwriter, somebody who lacks the rhythmic pentameter to write in verse, such as a suit at a desk uh, in some. Eastern no, but I, but I, but I think that they, the, the songwriting really belies how brilliant they are. And then, of course, Mickey and Andrew Weiss gave me the history of the Scorpions and and their psychedelic records from the late '60s, even. And like, what? Like, I, what are you talking about? You know. So there's so much to learn. And then Mickey was like, "Yeah, they went through four guitarists, and these guitarists are all like Robbie C. Agmongano. Like, right. they'll, all, they'll all blow your mind. So you you realize the depth of it all, and you know." I wish I could write a song like Rock Me Like a Hurricane, you know? But that's even late era. I mean, that's like 84, you know, like even between the psychedelic roots and that sort of stadium butt rock, they have like, you know, really pivotal record. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but I used to read this encyclopedia of metal by this guy named Martin Popoff, and he would write three pages on on the most obscure and and, and major uh, metal releases for, you know, over 20 years. And he had a lot of positive things to say about the Scorpions, the band, like late seventies, like before they kind of went global when they were kind of yeah. a more Judas Priest sounding band. Uh, yeah. So that again, makes the whole wind of change thing. So remarkable because it's light years from any of that stuff. And I guess that just adds a layer of irony and serendipity to the fact that you found the song the way you did, that you are in no way connected to any of that history, not the Scorpions, not the political context. You're wearing a hairband guy, that whole shit maybe blessedly passed you by and you arrived at the song in that obscure, like just a beautifully human way. So agreed, agreed. That's it. And and just to to touch on uh, your painting because you were selling the painting and that's what gave birth to the window change thing. But obviously, uh, as I I was unawares until I pre- prepared uh, this interview, I knew you were a painter only because I had read that. But uh, clicking around a little bit and looking at your site and the media over the years, obviously painting has been an enormous part of your artistic life and your professional life. So. Uh, Take us back to, like, when, when did you find painting and, like, what role does it play? I found it interesting you offhand mentioned you prefer painting in silence. Uh, I have I, been drawing cartoons or illustrations as a little kid. My mom's actually a, quite a talented painter. My dad dabbled in, like, illustrating a little bit um, just as a hobby. But, and they exposed, exposed us to art and brought us to great museums and stuff. Um, 
and my my siblings are pretty artistic as well. So I'd always been drawing. And then I went when I my my mom was real keen on me getting a degree and finishing school, even though I was already in a rock and roll band. And I'm like, I'm out. She's like, look, just get a degree. So I ended up going to Mass College of Art in Boston. Um, and I, I was, I took like a color theory class and I wanted to take the painting classes, but I've, I felt extremely intimidated by the painters. And I just like, I could never do that. I don't know why I was just like, ah, that's something I can't quite grasp. Um, and I ended up getting into what was called studio for interrelated media, which was basically like performance artists and Spalding Gray and Noam Chomsky would come and talk to the class. And that's in that class I met Dana Colley. Um, so I kind of used performance art as an excuse to get a degree from college or BFA in something. Um, but I knew that I always want, I always go in and hang out with the painters and watch them. And I, I always wanted to try to do it. And then, um, my best friend growing up, Jacques Hoffman's family had a collection of Haitian art in their home. And I always loved the simplicity and the outsider art nature of it. I felt like I could relate to like this, to, to the naivete of it. My mom had these, what they call naive folk art from Yugoslavia as well. And I was mesmerized by the colors. And so I just started painting over the years and consequently also had thousands of postage stamps that my father's secretary had saved for me. And by the time I was in my early twenties, I had thousands of these stamps. I was like, I'm not a real stamp collector. Like, what am I going to do with these things? The little pieces of art onto themselves. And so I started gluing them onto the canvas or the wood. And I got really into finding, like, I would never buy canvas. I would always pick, find things in the garbage or pieces of wood and just started gluing them. And they'd represent leaves of trees or feathers of a bird or bricks of a building. And I've been doing that ever since. And I've been in stamps ever since. People give me their stamp collections. I still have thousands of stamps. And I just, I just think of it as a, it's a great way to um, calm my mind. It's like meditation. You know, the music thing, it's definitely with people. I want to be with people. I want to work interactively with people. I love working with great engineers and beautiful studios. I love being around musicians who are better than me and just learning from them. And then the painting thing is like, oh, I can quiet down and tap into my subconscious. I, I'm not really, I, I'm not schooled enough to know technique or anything. I just do it very naively. And it, it's um, provided like a peace of mind for me. And then the, 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 the think that people might like to buy them or like it helps me to pay some bills is, is amazing. And I've, I've done thousands of paintings over the years because of that. Oh man, that's incredible. I always find it interesting when a musician has a, another form of media, like the late Neil Casal with his photography or whatever. Like it's just curious to find people's process and it's always light years away from the other process. Uh, and it sounds like that's the case with you as well. So yeah, uh, we'll definitely link your website, uh, in the in the show notes so in addition to your music people can check out at least like digitally view some of the artwork that you made over the years and uh one last oddball question would be the the character you mentioned like the character for Blanc du Blanc and uh um but I wanted to ask about okay so like the Joe Russo birthday video you dressed up as the character that's on the the cover of the Blanc du Blanc album. And you mentioned it was like a character, like a rapper. But when I looked at that, whatever costume or it's kind of like an art artistic, uh, outfit, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I was thinking like, I don't know if you ever saw true detective, but there was like this occult stuff in the woods out in like Louisiana, just real strange. Oh yeah. It had antlers on it. Yeah. Um, what, what is that about? What is that? character about what is, is the relation to Blanc du Blanc? Is that you like in all that stuff? Uh, that, well, I am wearing the costume if that, if that means anything, but I, yeah, that, I that's what I'm asking. I don't want it to be me, but yes, it is me. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it is me in the costume. And, uh, I've always been attracted to masks, you know, African masks and, uh, recently rent discovered, Damsel Frau on Instagram, and if you can go check out her work, and it, it occurred to me how beautiful they were, and I wanted to do something like that. I was inspired by that specifically, um, and then realized that there's a whole, you know, obviously a whole tradition of wearing masks and 
but they symbolize um, and and using that in performance. And that's sort of where I'm gravitating towards in terms of the costumes to eliminate age and race and, and to create some sort of fantastical world that's providing this music. Um, but, you know, Sarah McConnell pointed out that a lot of people don't know what dub music is, you know, and maybe this can be some sort of vehicle as a way of letting people know what's up. Like you obviously have done your homework and you've checked it out, but maybe a lot of people don't know that. So, if this is in some way a way to bring music to another audience. And like you said earlier in the show about maybe this is a ripple effect where it's spreading out and it's carrying on this long tradition of these sounds that I, you and I find solace in and maybe other people will too that didn't know. You know, I had friends I've grown up with and contacted me recently. They're like, what is dub music, you know? So it's obviously still very much underground in a lot of ways. Um, and if it can come out and this be the way, you know, I just think that like having something that's an alter ego and something that's not me, the Chris Harford singer songwritery guy to market is a lot of fun. And it's just something different. It's like, Oh yeah, I can get behind this mysterious character. And what is it exactly? Just like you said, like, what is this? And it can probably be a lot of things, you know? Yeah. I love that. I love everything about the, concept of it is removing all the variables that maybe people hold you know bias or judgment or whatever it is and just letting the art speak for itself with some inexplicable uh representation visually that embodies a whole lot that's rooted in it so yeah i'm just i'm just learning about mf doom you know he just passed away but like reading about his career and how he got developed that mask and what it meant and what he could oh, do behind, behind the mask. Like that's all new to me. And that's exactly the idea really kind of like you're behind the mask. So you're free to explore maybe the darker crevices of your subconscious or whatever it is you need to do to just work it out. So, Man, I am I, so excited for you that you just found doom. Like, Oh my God, it's a, it's a, a boundless well of, of, of to just yeah buckle up man you're stoked <laughs> uh, yeah it, it sounds like it like i had no idea so yeah awesome we get another thing to like sink my teeth into exactly and that's the beauty of music is the connectivity of everything and just how like you know it took his death and your interest in masking with regard to the music that will like propel you into this catalog that uh, honestly is is a unicorn and not just in hip-hop but music itself and, and much like you, he touched a lot of different genres and lives and collaborated with, you know, bold font names, yet uh, remained this uh, sort of inaccessible and uh, mysterious till the very end. So much so that he had been dead for two months before the rest of us found out, which is remarkable in this day and age. Right, right. It is remarkable. And then it also ties into all those early reggae covers with the cartoons you know, like action figures or space invaders or, you know, and the P-Funk drawings and all that kind exactly. of concept of have, having this character, these characters. Yeah, so, man. You know, in, in the process of each musician that might partake in, in Blanc to Blanc would have a created costume for them that reflects their spirituality and their personality in some way, in that, in that way. Right on. Well, dude, I really appreciate your time. And, of course, all the stories and reflections and perspectives. I got an education, uh, and hopefully my listeners will feel the same. But the uh, well, last thing I, I always ask is uh, for, like, a recommendation of sorts. Um, if there's an artist, an album, a song, something that's really, like, getting you through, that you're finding the solace and comfort in at this moment or in general, um, kind of like an off the cuff thing. Don't think too hard about it. Welding by you, Roy. Uh, rest in peace. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, man. Yeah. Welding. Yeah. Oh, deep, heavy tune. <laughs> yeah. Sure. That, that song, that song has been slaying me lately. Well, yeah, we'll definitely, uh, and link to I that. I want to give a shout out to Sarah McConnell for linking us and, you know, obviously music is a, a vital part of our lives, yours, mine, hers, and it's what's getting us through all this craziness. So 
I'm very grateful to talk to you and to know that the music's connecting in such a manner and to her for making this connection. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time and, and caring and spinning the records and, and, and spreading the word. Oh, man. Agreed. Sarah is a gem, and I'm grateful that she connected us, too. And thank you for the kind words. And, yeah, man, we left a lot on the table. Yours is a long story and journey, so we'll do it again down the road, I'm sure. Well, good. Well, next time we can talk about my relationship with songwriting with the Irish poet Paul Muldoon and that whole chapter, so we can save that for the next time. Yeah, I would love to hear all about it. Please do. Okay, good. All right, my brother. You have a great day, and again, thank you. Thanks. Thanks to all the listeners. Thanks, Brian. Take it easy. Peace. Peace. Yes, indeedy. I want to say thank you and a deep bow of gratitude to my man, Chris Harford. Wow. Again, totally humbled and blown away by that profound powwow. It was so rewarding and fulfilling just to have that conversation, and I'm honored and really grateful to be able to uh, broadcast it out into the interwebs. With that, I uh, want to say, uh, check out Blanc du Blanc. You're hearing Kapow Dub, and they have the album, the Blanc album, and then they have the EP of Wind of Change. You heard all about that stuff. I can't wait. I want to check in with Chris, uh, with Chuck Treese. Maybe one day I'll have Marco and or Joe on the show, but this was just just a banger and i hope everybody that's listening uh stuck it out obviously made it this far uh give thanks for everyone checking in and supporting the up for life podcast i have to switch it up a little bit on the vibe junkie jam of the week uh because i got penalized for playing a song a long time ago the pod was off the air for a few days and uh, i might even uh you know we'll see i gotta figure out what's kosher and what's not but i'm gonna play something from blanc du blanc i mean you heard the way these cats talk about chris harford as a songwriter as a musician as a conduit so i would love to play like some of his singer songwriter stuff or whatever but i encourage you to check that out chris harford chris harford band of changes i'm just not sure if you know what label or what's what and i've got to be more careful i'm not sure how many people actually need to hear the songs on the podcast i can mention them so leaf of fall i would play in its entirety um you can find that on uh chris harford's uh spotify but i'm gonna play cometh dub which is the last dub on blanc du blanc's album the blanc album it's just the heaviest fucking dub just uh all the cats you know you hear about who's all the cooks in the kitchen on this dana collie and uh marco benevento and chuck treese and and it's not even sure who's on the cometh dub but just the not even going to try. I'm just going to play the dub. I play it on vinyl all the time here at the crib, and it's medicine. So Blanc du Blanc on Soul Selects, the Blanc album, the Vibe Junkie Jam, like we always do about this time. And that'll be episode 44 of the Up for Life podcast. Check us out, patreon.com backslash up for life. Rate, review the podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or your podcast platform of choice. Send me an email, bgets at upfullife.com. Goodbye, jobless, and we'll see you next time.